Reagan was elected to the presidency, he installed Louis Giafrida as head of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Giafrida was an old cold warrior from Reagan's California days whose specialty was suppression of unrest and dissent. Giafrida, North, and George Bush began to turn FEMA into an instrument of domestic anti-terrorism. You're dealing with a group of people in the Reagan administration who equated political dissent with treason and who cannot differentiate between emergency procedures, which I think everyone agrees are necessary, and suppressing political dissent. And with North and Poindexter and Casey, you had a group of people who saw Americans who disagree with them as the enemy. Now, the key has been, in their planning, has been a war. A war, you have a national, you know, security emergency. Uh, you, you can declare martial law. You can take emergency measures in war that you can't uh, argue in peacetime. And this is where they were heading towards the invasion of Nicaragua. And it was derailed by the, not just the Iran-Contra scandal, although that definitely derailed it or postponed it, but also the break apart of the Reagan machine. There was just so much corruption. He had too many incompetent wild men running the thing for him, dealing with people like Oliver North, when he should have had the Carluccis in there to begin with, who, who would do about the same thing, but more credibly, more, more, more soberly, more sane, more, with more credibility in the establishment. He was beginning to come apart last fall before the Iran-Contra thing uh, crashed, uh, brought him down to a point. Now the big question that we, we debate everywhere, I debate it everywhere, I discuss it with the Daniel Ellsbergs and David McMichaels as I travel, and lots of other people, is whether or not he will succeed in invading Nicaragua. And that's a horror unto itself. But I have the feeling that people miss the broader implications of this invasion when it happens. Now the Christic Institute, this flawed affidavit, it has a, seg a segment on the Rex 84, the detention centers, the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which is part of this plan, uh, which is to, to prepare detention centers and laws uh, and an infrastructure across the country so that when they pull off the invasion, they will be able to, to, to sweep 400,000 people off the streets and throw them in detention centers. Colonel North, in your work at the uh, NSC, were you not assigned at one time to work on plans for the continuity of government in the event of a major disaster? Mr. Chairman, I believe that question touches upon a highly sensitive and classified area, so may I request that you not touch upon that, sir? I was particularly concerned, Mr. Chairman, because I read in Miami papers and several others that there had been a plan uh, developed by that same agency, a contingency plan in the event of an emergency that would suspend the American Constitution. And I was deeply concerned about it and wondered if that was the area in which he had worked. I believe yeah, he was. Yeah, I most, I yeah, I most respectfully request that that matter not be touched upon at this stage. If we wish to get into this, I'm certain arrangements can be made for an executive session. And tragically, the only member who got close was Jack Brooks, and he was stopped by the church. Now, this one, I asked the, the FEMA people, the, the sober uh, ones there, uh, if they really had this documented. Because we talked about this Rex 84 two or three years ago, and the spotlight had mentioned it, but uh, it, it wasn't really proven. And uh, they assured me, they said, yes, they have this one from top attorneys within FEMA who have admitted to it. And they've got it documented. When President Reagan and Attorney General Edwin Meese appeared in the White House briefing room on short notice today, no one was prepared for their surprising announcements that money from the controversial Iran arms deal was secretly funneled to the Contra rebels fighting the Sandinista government of Nicaragua. According to Attorney General Edwin Meese, Admiral John Poindexter, director of the National Security Council, knew about the secret transfer of money and one of his deputies, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, arranged it. Poindexter resigned. North was fired. For his part, the president said he was not informed of North's scheme. 
And at the White House tonight, NBC's Chris Wallace has more on these unexpected developments. Chris? Tom, officials here are calling it the worst scandal of the Reagan presidency, jeopardizing his policy in the Mideast and now Central America, and costing him a top advisor. The president was still maintaining today that his Iranian arms deal was not a mistake. But he said that over the weekend, the Justice Department uncovered one operation he had not known about, which led to Poindexter's resignation and North's dismissal. The information brought to my attention yesterday convinced me that in one aspect, implementation of that policy was seriously flawed. The president refused to say what the flaw was, leaving that to Attorney General Meese. And what Meese described was a scheme devised by North to get around the congressional ban against military aid to the Contras, then in effect. This year, he said, the U.S. sent $12 million in weapons to Israel, which Israeli agents then sold to Iran for much higher prices, 10 to $30 million more. The Israelis paid the $12 million back to the U.S., but transferred the extra money to Swiss bank accounts, controlled by the Contras. The only persons in the United States government uh, that knew precisely about this, uh, the only person, was Lieutenant Colonel North. Admiral Poindexter did know that something of this nature was occurring, but he did not look into it further. The Attorney General said later former National Security Advisor McFarlane had also been aware of the scheme. But Meese maintained involvement did not go any higher, that the president, Vice President Bush, Chief of Staff Reagan, Secretary of State Schultz, and CIA Director Casey all did not know of the plan. Meese did not explain how a Marine lieutenant colonel on his own could have arranged a deal involving three countries and millions of dollars, or why an admiral known for playing by the bureaucratic rules would not have told superiors. Meese said he's looking into whether any laws have been broken and a blue ribbon panel will review NSC operations. But Poindexter's wife said he and North did nothing to embarrass the government. That his decision to resign was to assist the president in continuing on with reforming the country, and I don't think they're being made a scapegoat by anybody. White House officials hope today's action will satisfy demands for a staff shakeup. But there is continuing bitterness inside the administration toward Schultz for distancing himself from Mr. Reagan. And Mies hinted Schultz could be next. I think anyone who is a member of the president's staff or the president's cabinet has an obligation either to support the policy decisions of the president or to get out. But the biggest worry here tonight is just how far the Iranian operation went. Because after today's extraordinary events, many officials here are concerned. Whether there's anything, they still don't know. Hello, thanks for joining us. Tonight, the international spy scandal with an Australian connection, and later we'll talk to South Africa's Foreign Minister, Pick Borter, a man on a mission to improve relations between Canberra and Pretoria. It's a spy scandal that's already rocked the White House, an intrigue that could threaten the presidency of George Bush. This story centers on incredible allegations of spying on a scale never before imagined. It involves America's Central Intelligence Agency selling computer programs to foreign nations. These programs allegedly allowed the CIA to spy on the intelligence agencies that bought it. And one of the purchases was Australia. We've been able to track down two key witnesses to those dealings, witnesses who are now in fear of their lives. Michael Holmes reports. It may be the most bizarre spy story ever. A story of corruption and betrayal at the highest levels of the American government. A story of hostages used as pawns. Of the CIA spying on its friends. Of murders made to look like suicides. I think it's about time to get the whole story out. His name is Ari ben Menashe. He's a former Israeli intelligence agent. Once it's out, there's no reason to hurt me physically anymore. And today, he is hiding in Australia, in fear, he says, of his life. So many people in the last 10 years who were working for the various governments on these issues, due to cover-ups, died mysteriously. He claims the United States tried to spy on ASIO, the Australian Security Intelligence Organization, by selling it a computer program that contained a hidden keyhole, a lock for which the CIA had a master key. 
The computer software is called Promise. It's designed to track millions of pieces of information on tens of thousands of people. And it's alleged to have been installed in dozens of government departments and security agencies around the world. It's also alleged that American intelligence made some small modifications to the program, modifications that enabled it to key in a special access code and gain entry to all the information on the computer. It would be equivalent to going into ASIO or ASIO and reading the handwritten files of all the agents, except the computer has them neatly organized and typed and instantly indexed so it's much more convenient. Bill Hamilton owns Inslaw, the company that developed Promise and offered it to the American government. They would not have bothered to sell it to all these countries without first preparing it in such a way that it would be an easier avenue of penetration into the files of these foreign governments. The whole story might never have emerged but for the fact that the American government didn't own Promise. It pirated the software from Bill Hamilton's company. We were dumbfounded. Couldn't conceive of it. Hamilton's contract with the US Department of Justice to supply the Promise software was cancelled in 1982 without any real explanation. Only some time later did Hamilton hear that his software was turning up all over the world. I don't know how much Australia paid. I've been told that Israel paid 5.5 million. Ari Ben Menashe confirms that Promise was sold to Israel, but claims the Israelis, unlike the Australians, were in on the secret. The whole idea was that we would study it, the Americans then would sell it to our neighbors, and then we could, by using telephone lines, get into their, uh, our neighbors' computers. But then our American friends just took it a step further. They s sold it to their allies as well, including Australia. The list of countries which allegedly bought the Promise software reads like a who's who of America's friends, as well as its most bitter enemies. Is spy on your friends uh, considered you know, a fair thing to do in the intelligence world? Oh, it is. It's always done. Um, using a Trojan horse to go inside the agency, that gets a little aggressive, you know. It all sounds a bit too bizarre to be true, but we've now been able to track down a key witness to a prison near Seattle in Washington State. So you are 100% sure that Promise, or a derivative of Promise, was bought by Australia to be used in our intelligence and law enforcement Absolutely, agencies? Absolutely, uh, because I, I uh, uh, spent uh, several thousand man hours of uh, programming time with a programming team, uh, you know, developing that subset. This unlikely looking character is a computer genius. His name is Michael Riconosciuto. And he says he was in charge of modifying the Promise program so that it could be accessed by American intelligence. So whoever was holding that master key could do what? Basically uh, break into it and spy. ASIO says it doesn't have and has never had the Promise software. Of course, it won't go into any detail about what sort of computer programs it does have, which is very handy because, according to Michael Riconosciuto, the Promise software was often altered and given different names before it was sold. Indeed, Riconosciuto claims he specifically modified the program for Australia at the request of ASIO. I basically had to change the communications protocol, which is how that software package interacts with other software packages already resident in the computer system. In a federal court hearing, Judge well, George Basin ruled the Justice Department had used illegal and underhanded methods to bankrupt Bill Hamilton's Inslaw company. He ordered the government to pay Inslaw $8 million. Yeah. Trickery, fraud and deceit. You use those words when describing how the Justice Department stole the software. Do you stand by those words? Yes. 
I, there's no question in my mind about it. Uh, the evidence was overwhelming. So why was the Justice Department so desperate to get the software from Bill Hamilton? To answer that, you have to go back to 1980. Iran had seized American hostages. All evidence proves that these people are spies. If President Carter could secure their release, he'd have a big advantage in the upcoming US elections. My thoughts and my prayers for our hostages in Iran are as though they were my own sons and daughters. It's now alleged that the Reagan campaign made a deal with the Iranians, a deal to keep the hostages until after the election, thus denying Carter the credit for their freedom. The man alleged to have helped organise this deal is a Reagan political crony called Earl Bryan and his payoff three years later on the promised software. About an hour and a half outside Washington DC you'll find this place, Earl Bryan's multi-million dollar country estate. If you believe Michael Reconosciuto, it's the house Promise bought. Now we'd like to bring you Earl Bryan personally denying that claim but he's not being interviewed by anybody. All we got was this letter from his lawyers threatening action if we so much as associate Earl Bryan's name with this story. He had the contacts to help make sure that certain elements in Iran would not make a deal with President Carter in 1980 so that President Carter could not recover in the polls and that Reagan would win the election. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that Just I... Just five minutes after Ronald Reagan took the oath of office, Iran announced that the hostages would be released. Some 30 minutes ago, the planes bearing our prisoners left Iranian airspace and are now free. And the story doesn't end there. In a moment, the murders that have been linked to the spy scandal. There are many shady characters in this story. Spies, former spies, people with something to hide. But there are players with impeccable credentials too. In part two of this investigation, we meet a man whose background more than qualifies him to know a scandal when he smells one. What is being said about this conspiracy points to criminal conduct much worse than anything in Watergate. And Elliot Richardson should know. 17 years ago, he resigned as U.S. Attorney General on a matter of principle after clashing with Richard Nixon during the Watergate scandal. Today, Richardson is legal counsel for Inslaw, and once again, he has the White House in his sights. It might be reluctant to, to have it emerge that the, the US government had, through uh, clandestine means, planted uh, software on foreign intelligence agencies so that the U.S. would be better able, as the phrase goes, to read their mail. The number of uh, murders that have occurred uh, to uh, prevent uh, leaks uh, are incredible. There's nearly 50 murders that can be directly ascribed uh, to this pattern of activity. The Promise Affair and the allegation that Ronald Reagan and George Bush made a deal for the hostages to be kept until after the 1980 election were being investigated by journalist and author Danny Casolaro. He said he had it. He had some already and he was going to West Virginia to meet the source who had given him that evidence this source was now, he said, going to supply additional conclusive proof. But Danny Casolaro never got to reveal either his source or the hard evidence he said was going to break the scandal wide open. On August the 10th, his body was found in this hotel room in West Virginia. His wrists had been slashed an incredible 12 times. 
Danny Casolaro's body was found naked in a pool of bloody water in the bathtub. All his papers were gone. Within hours, local police had declared the death a suicide. You have a, a case of forensic artistry, you know, shall we say, where you have professionally trained people that set up a crime scene and they make it phenomenally difficult for investigators to, uh, to backtrack, make a murder look like a suicide. His body was embalmed by Monday morning by the time we found out. That is against the law in West Virginia. His body was embalmed without family consent. That certainly makes an autopsy a little more difficult. Tony Casolaro says his brother Danny, pictured here at a nephew's birthday, just wasn't the suicidal type. He was describing for me a few weeks before he died what he was doing and some of the people involved. And he said uh, a lot of accidents had happened to people who were working on the things that he had been working on. He said, you know, if an accident happens to me, don't believe it. But bad things seem to happen to people who make waves in the Inslaw affair. Earlier this year, Michael Riconosciuto contacted Bill Hamilton and signed a sworn affidavit for Hamilton's lawsuit against the Justice Department. Do you believe Michael Riconosciuto did alter the software as he claimed he did? Yes, I, I do. Almost immediately, Riconosciuto was contacted by a Justice Department official and given a very clear message. Back off or else. Less than two weeks after that threat, Michael Riconosciuto was arrested on drug charges. My main concern right now is staying alive and protecting my family. Right. And remember Judge Basin, who found in favour of Inslaw against the Justice Department. Right. Well, a few months later, Judge Basin's reappointment to the bench, thought to be a formality, was blocked by the Justice Department. Yeah. His career has been destroyed. Would you still be a judge if you hadn't handed down the decision you did? I think I would be. I rendered the, quote, wrong decision in uh, the case of Inslaw versus uh, Department of Justice. Your replacement in the bankruptcy court was a lawyer who argued for the Justice Department in this case. Yes. It, does that smell? Is that worthy it's, of... it's certainly an odd coincidence, isn't it? Every time you figuratively pick up a rock, in this case, you find maggots under it. Michael Holmes reporting on the saga that is now the subject of a US congressional inquiry. Next up, South Africa's... Attorney General Elliot Richardson, who now represents Inslaw, says there's only one way to find the truth. If there was not enough reason before to justify a full-scale, all-out, hard-hitting, impartial federal investigation, the case for doing that now is overwhelming. Former Attorney General Ed Meese disagrees. The question is whether there's any legal basis for it, and I think uh, the people have looked into it, including uh, Attorney General Thornburg, uh, have indicated there is no basis for it and I would certainly have more confidence in Mr. Thornburg's judgment uh, as an impartial uh, person on the subject than I would uh, Mr. Richardson, who's obviously a partisan and represents one of the parties. A House subcommittee led by Congressman Jack Brooks has been investigating the Inslaw case for two years. Brooks has accused the Justice Department of stonewalling the committee's investigation by refusing for two years to release more than 400 documents relating to Inslaw. Faced with a subpoena, Attorney General Dick Thornburg finally produced some documents this summer, but told committee investigators some were either lost or stolen. Even President Bush is being questioned about Inslaw. Fairly soon, I'd say. The Inslaw case, Mr. President. The Inslaw case. Are you going to have I know his Bush views on that. that. He doesn't have to explain. I know. What was the last? The, the last Justice part? Department no. says it has been able to reconstruct 90% of the missing documents but a source close to the Brooks Committee says there's no way to tell how many documents are missing or how important they are to solving the mysterious Inslaw case. Casey Wyan, CNN Business News. Guns, drugs, and the CIA. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle.
WNET, New York, WPBT, Miami, WTBS, Detroit, and WGBH, Boston. This is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. Two of the most persistent offensives of the Reagan presidency have been the war against communism in Central America and the war on drugs here at home. But investigations of America's secret war in Nicaragua have revealed mounting evidence that the Central Intelligence Agency has been fighting the Contra War with the help of international drug traffickers. It is not a new story. Tonight's frontline investigation traces the CIA's involvement with drug lords back to the agency's birth following World War II. It is a long history that asks this question. In the war on drugs, which side is the CIA on? Our program was produced by Leslie and Andrew Coburn. It is called Guns, Drugs, and the CIA and is reported by Leslie Coburn. Illegal drugs are one thing no community in America can, should, or needs to tolerate. America's already starting to take that message to heart. That's why I believe the tide of battle has turned, and we're beginning to win the crusade for a drug-free America. Subcommittee on Narcotics, Terrorism, International Operations will come to order. From what we have learned these past months, our declaration on war against drugs seems to have produced a war of words and not action. Our borders are inundated with more narcotics than at any time ever before. It seems as though stopping drug trafficking in the United States has been a secondary U.S. foreign policy objective, sacrificed repeatedly for other political and institutional goals, such as changing the government of Nicaragua, supporting the government of Panama, using drug-running organizations as intelligence assets, and protecting military and intelligence sources from possible compromise through involvement in drug trafficking. If we start with the premise that drug trafficking is uh, morally reprehensible, uh, our government agencies are not supposed to do anything like that. But they deal in a practical world. Would you raise your right hand, please? Ramon Millan Rodriguez saw that world as the chief accountant of the Colombian cocaine cartel, responsible for managing $11 billion in drug profits. Now serving a 43-year sentence for money laundering, he has been a key witness for a Senate investigation probing links between drugs and the CIA. Let's say, for instance, a um, drug group was involved in a war with a terrorist group, a communist terrorist group. Well, it would behoove the CIA to give that drug group as much help and advice as possible so they could win their little war. <laughs> the history of the CIA uh, runs parallel to criminal and drug operations throughout the world, but it's, it's coincidental. Victor Marchetti came to know the world of covert operations as a longtime CIA officer. He is the highest ranking agency official ever to go public about what he learned. It goes all the way back to the predecessor organization, OSS, and its involvement with the Italian Mafia, with La Cosa Nostra in Sicily and southern Italy. Later on, when they were fighting um, the uh, communists in uh, France and that, they got in tight with the Corsican Brotherhood. The Corsican Brotherhood, of course, were big dope dealers. As things changed in the, in the world, the CIA got involved with Kulintang types um, in Burma who were drug runners because they were uh, resisting uh, the drift uh, towards communism there. Uh, same thing happened in Southeast Asia, later in Latin America. And some of the very people who are the best sources of information or who are capable of accomplishing things and the like happen to be the criminal element. The CIA has had a solid rule against being involved in drug trafficking. That's not to say that some of the people whom CIA has used or been in touch with over the years may well have themselves been involved in drug traffic, but not the CIA. If the CIA is going to, if, if their job is to maintain the uh, safety of our country and freedom by uh, manipulating uh, 
foreign powers to do what this country wants. And if the God is holding the power at that particular moment happens to be a drug lord, then you have to get involved with the drug lord. As a result, we kept getting involved with these kind of, of people, not for drug purposes and not for personal gain, but to achieve a higher ideological goal. In a refugee camp in northeast Thailand, there lived the remnants of one such involvement. They are the Hmong, or Mayo tribe. While American troops were fighting in Vietnam, these people were the foot soldiers of a secret CIA army. They fought an undeclared war in northern Laos, across the border from North Vietnam. They're hill people. They're uh, little guys. Like most hill people, they're pretty fierce. In uh, Laos, we were the guerrillas. The war in Laos was, was a textbook example of what can be done in unconventional warfare. General Richard Secord is one of many veterans of the CIA's secret war in Laos. Because Laos was officially neutral, American troops could not be used. The CIA relied on massive air power and a tribal army to fight the local communists and the North Vietnamese. On the ground in northern Laos, a handful of CIA officers directed as many as 85,000 soldiers drawn from the mountain tribes. But American officials did more than just send their allies into battle. Early on, I think that we all believed that what we were doing was in the best interest of America, that, that, that we, we were in fact perhaps um, involved in some not so desirable aspects of, uh, of the, uh, the, the drug traffic. However, uh, we believed strongly in the beginning that we were there for a just cause. Ron Rickenback served in Laos as an official for the U.S. Agency for International Development from 1962 to 1969. He was on the front lines. These people were willing to take up arms. We needed to stop the red threat. And people believe that in, in that vein, we made, you know, certain compromises or certain trade-offs for a larger good. Growing opium was a natural agricultural enterprise for these people. And they had been doing it for many, many years before the Americans ever got there. When we got there, they continued to do so. When they would move from one place to another, they would carry their little uh, bags of opium. They smoked it, by the way, in pipes. And opium could be bought in the uh, streets of any village. When a farmer raised a crop of opium, what he got for his year's worth of work was the equivalent of 35 to 40 U.S. dollars. That amount of opium, were it refined in the morphine base, then into morphine, then into heroin, and appeared on the streets of New York, that $35 crop of opium would be worth fifty, sixty, a hundred thousand dollars in 1969 dollars. Maybe it's a million dollars today. The war isolated the Mayo tribespeople in their remote villages. CIA-owned Air America planes became their only lifeline to the outside world. While Mayo children came to believe that rice fell from the sky, Mayo farmers, witnesses say, could count on Air America to move their cash crop. It was then the presence of these air support services in and out of the areas in question where the product, where the opium was grown, that greatly facilitated an increase in production and an ease of transshipment from the point of agriculture to the point of processing. So when I say the Americans greased the wheels, essentially what I'm saying is we did not create opium production. We did not create a situation where drug trafficking was happening. But because of the nature of our presence, this very intense American means that was made available to the situation, um, it, it accelerated in proportion dramatically. The possibility that Air America flew drugs is still hotly disputed by many former senior officers. You can question any number of uh, people who were, uh, who were there, who actually were there, not people who claim that they had some knowledge of rumors. Uh, you can question any number of people, and I venture to say that they will all support what I'm saying, and that is 
that uh, there was no commercial trade in opium going on. And I was on the airstrip. Um, that was my job, to move in and about and to go from place to place. And my people were in charge of dispatching aircraft. I was in the areas where opium was transshipped. I personally was a witness to opium being placed on aircraft, American aircraft. I witnessed it being taken off smaller aircraft that were coming in from outlying sites. Yes, I've seen the sticky bricks come on board and no one was uh, challenging their right to carry it. It was their own property. Neil Hansen is a former senior Air America pilot, now serving a sentence for smuggling cocaine. We were uh, some sort of a, a, a freebie airline in some respects uh, there. Uh, whoever the customer or uh, the local representative put on the airplane, we flew. Primarily, it was transported on our smaller aircraft, the Helios, the Porters, and things like that that would visit the little outlying villages. They would send their opium to market. From the villages, the planes took their cargo over the mountains to Longchen, CIA headquarters for the war. It was a secret city, unmarked on any map and carefully hidden from outsiders. Longchen became one of the busiest airports in the world, with hundreds of landings and takeoffs a day. And at the height of the war, then there were thousands of people in there. There were villages all over. There were landing pads up on what we call Skyline Drive, which was the, the ridge on the north side of Longchen. T-28s were going in and out of there. C-130s were going in and out of there. It was an amazing place, just amazing. Ed Dearborn is a veteran of Longchen and Air America, a key figure in the covert air operation. From a sleepy little valley and village, you know, uh, surrounded by the mountains and the cars to this great war machine actually working up there. It was the heart and pulse of, of Laos at that time more commonly referred to as the CIA's secret base, you know. <laughs> to lead their male army, the CIA selected Vang Pao, a former lieutenant in the French colonial army in Laos. The agency made every effort to boost his reputation. His name was Vang Pao, a charismatic, passionate, and committed man. A patriot without a country. Vang Pao, however, did more than just lead his people in war. According to observers, he and his officers dominated the trade in the male farmer's cash crop. In 1968, one visitor got a first-hand look at this trade in a village called Long Pot. I was given the guest bed in the village, in fact, the district headman's house, and I ended up sharing it with a guy uh, in military uniform who I later found out was an officer of the Vang Pao army. And one morning I was awoken uh, very early by this great confusion of people and noise at the bottom of the bed. I mean, just literally people brushing up against my feet with these packets uh, of black sticky, sticky substance in bamboo tubes and wrapped up in leaves and bits and things. And the military officer was there was weighing it out and paying off you know, a considerable amount of money to these people. And there was, this went on you know, for most of the morning and it went on for several mornings and he bought up a great deal of this substance which I then started to think about and you know, asked and had it confirmed that this was in fact raw opium. War photographer John Everingham has lived in Southeast Asia for over 20 years. He was one of the very few outsiders who dared to look for and photograph the secret army for himself. They all wore American supplied uniform and the villagers very innocently and very openly told me oh they took it to Long Cheng and I asked them how they took it, and they said, oh, well, they took it on the helicopters as everything else that went to and from Longcheng went by helicopter, and so did the opium. And whose helicopters were they? Well, they were the Air America helicopters, which were on contract to the CIA. We did not go down to the embassy and be privy to their uh, secret briefings or anything else. Uh, we flew the airplanes. They put something on the airplane and told you not to look at it. You didn't look at it because you'd no longer be employed. I know as a fact that uh, soon after the army was formed, the military officers soon got control of the opium trade. It helped not only them make a lot of money and become good, loyal officers to the CIA, uh, but it helped the villagers. I mean, the villagers needed their opium carried out, and uh, carried over land in a war situation was much more dangerous and more difficult. 
and the officers were obviously paying a good price because the villagers were very eager to sell to the uh, military people. That's hogwash. No way, and as far as the agency, ever, ever advocating. That is, you think that I would be in an organization where I've devoted my life to my country, involved in an operation like that without blowing the whistle? Absolutely not. God be with us until we meet again. By your counsels, God uphold us. With your own, securely fold us. God be with us until we meet again. For veterans like General Adderholt and General Secord, the war in Laos is now commemorated at nostalgic reunions. Last fall, they gathered at a Florida airbase to talk over old times and current business. <laughs> While Vang Pao does not attend such functions, he is well remembered by his old comrades. Was the agency responsible for people's salaries? Were they paying Vang Pao? Oh, of course, they were 100% responsible because Vang Pao was respons responding to agency requirements. Even though they may have come from the highest level of the U.S. government, yes, of course. He was in the chain of command? Yes. Did you work with Vang Pao? Sure, all the time. What was your relationship? I was his uh, supplier of air, therefore he um, stayed in close contact with me. Were you in charge of supplying Air America planes? Uh, for the tactical air operations, yes. The movement of Air America planes, say witnesses, was influenced by Vang Pao's business requirements. Vang Pao wanted control of the aircraft. Sure, he would do the work that needed to be done, but it would give him that much more freedom and that much more flexibility to use these aircraft to go out and pick up the opium that needed to be picked up at this site or that site and to bring it back to Longchang. And there was quite a hassle, and Vang Pao won. And not only did he get control of the aircraft, but there was also a question of the operational control of the airplane that were leaving Vientiane to go south, even into Thailand. And there was an embarrassing situation where the Americans knew that this could be exposed, and it would be a very compromising situation. The way they got around that was, was to concede to create for Vang Pao his own local airline. And Xiangkhuang Airlines came into reality as a direct result of this compromise that was worked out and they brought in a C-47 from from the states and they painted it up nice and put Sien Kwong Airlines on it and they gave it to Vang Pao and that aircraft was largely used for the transshipment of opium from Longchang to sites further south. Air opium. Air opium. Those airplanes didn't really belong to Vang Pao. They belonged to the agency. They belonged to the agency. They were maintained by the United States uh, uh, government in the form of Air America or Continental. Uh, so they didn't really own anything. It wasn't something he could take away with him. It's something that we controlled every iota of that operation, lock, stock, and barrel. Do you know what the nickname for that airline was? No. Opium Air. I've never heard that before. Back in the old days, the men who flew for Air America and drank in the Purple Porpoise were less discreet. Most of them are long gone and far away from Laos now, but one legendary CIA officer still lives across the Mekong River, close to his old mountain battleground. Well, the man that was in charge of that local operation was a man by the name of uh, Tony Poe, and he was notorious. Um, he had been involved with the agency from the OSS days. He was a World War II combat veteran and had been with the agency from its inception and he was the prototype operations officer. He, they made a movie uh, about him uh, when they made Apocalypse Now. He was the caricature of uh, Marlon Brando. Until now, Tony Poe has never talked publicly about the Laos operation. He saw it from beginning to end. One of Vang Pao's early case officers Poe claims he was transferred from Long Chen because unlike his successors, he refused to tolerate the male leader's corruption. You don't let him run loose without a chain on him. You've got to control him. It's like any kind of an animal or a baby. You have to control him. 
Hey, he's the only guy that had a pair of shoes when I first met him. What are we talking about? Where, why does he need uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, apartments and uh, hotels and, and homes where he never had them in his life before? Why are you going to give it to him? Plus, I mean, he was making money on the side with his business. Oh, he was making millions because he had his own source of uh, avenue for his own uh, heroin. What did he do with the money? Well, he, <laughs> what do you mean? U.S. bank accounts, Switzerland, wherever. Didn't they know when Bank Pao said, I want some aircraft? Didn't they know what he wanted that for? I'm sure we all knew it, what was going to, but we were trying to monitor it because we control most of the pilots, you see. We're giving him a freedom of uh, navigation in the Thailand, in the bases. And we don't want him to get involved in, uh, in moving, you know, this illicit traffic. Okay, silver bars and gold, okay, but not heroin. Uh, what they would do is they weren't going into Thailand, they were flying it in a big wet wing airplane that could fly for 13 hours, a DC-3, and all the wings were filled with gas. They fly down to Pak Se, then they fly over to Da Nang, and then the number two guy, the President Two, would receive it. Nguyen Van Chu was president of South Vietnam from 1967 to 1975. Reports at that time accused President Chu of financing his election through the heroin trade. Like Vang Pao, he always denied it, remaining America's honored and indispensable ally. They were all in a contractual relationship. Some of this goes to me and some goes to this. And, you know, just like bankers and businessmen, they had a bookkeeping. We delivered you on a certain day. They had coded messages. And that means that so-and-so or this much comes back and goes into our Swiss bank account. Boom, they had a wonderful relationship. And every maybe six months, they'd all come together at a party somewhere and talk about their business, and it's good or bad. It's like the mafia. Mm, yeah, big organized mafia. By the end of 1970, there were 30,000 Americans in Vietnam addicted to heroin. GIs were dying from overdoses at the rate of two a day. When the drug traffic became a real problem to the American troops in Vietnam, then the CIA was asked by our president to get involved in the program to limit that traffic and stop it. But in 1972, a U.S. intelligence agent in Southeast Asia sent a secret field report to Customs. It suggested a serious conflict of interest. Quote, it was ironic that the CIA should be given the responsibility of narcotics intelligence, particularly since they were supporting the prime movers. Even though the CIA was, in fact, facilitating the movement of opiates to the U.S., they steadfastly hid behind the shield of secrecy and said that all was done in the interest of national security." End quote. I doubt that they had any real strong, deep understanding of what they were allowing to happen by uh, turning their head the other way and letting Van Pau ship his dope out, which was made into heroin, which was going to our troops, which was corrupting uh, uh, people throughout Southeast Asia and back here, the effect it had on crime. And I doubt that any one of them really thought in those terms at the time. While the heroin trade was flourishing by 1970, the war in Laos was going badly. As the communists steadily advanced, the civilian population faced a choice between evacuation to refugee camps or being bombed by the U.S. Air Force. These operations only added to the huge cost of feeding, training, and supplying the secret army. For a war that did not officially exist, the CIA was spending heavily. The money was always there. We had a program. In fact, that's the reason the agency supply system was so much better than the military supply system. Cash. They did the cash. They didn't have to go through a procurement system a bureaucracy <clears throat> that made everything cost three times as much. On two different occasions, uh, I brought bags up that I knew was payroll. 
Wish I'd have crashed on those times and they will stick that somewhere back in the jungle and go get it because it was unaccounted funds. <laughs> How much money would be in a bag? Well, I, you know, a, a bag would probably have a couple hundred thousand dollars in it depending on what, where you were going with it and who it was going to. I was sitting up there in the, in the, in the, uh, director, on the director's staff and that's where it all came together. For operations such as Laos, the CIA director's senior staff prepared the agency's official budget. For Laos, I think it was around 30 million, perhaps 40 million, but it was very small. Was that, in fact, enough yeah. to run this, this war? Well, I don't think so. I, uh, I would think that the war was costing quite a bit. Uh, probably, uh, uh, if all the costs were pulled together, um, I would imagine it would, would probably cost as much as the entire agency's budget. How is the war in Laos financed? U.S. appropriated funds. Through which agency? I think through the CIA and through the Defense Department, both. A secret Pentagon report put the Defense Department contribution to the war in Laos at $146 million in 1970. But the report also showed that the CIA was spending up to $60 million more than they were getting from Congress. Well, there may have been uh, other funds generated by Vang Pao himself through, the, uh, through his dope operations. Uh, after all, I mean, they, did, they were poppy growers and uh, opium smugglers. So I imagine there was money being earned that way. Uh, that was uh, Van Powell's uh, contribution to the war. Is it conceivable that the CIA would fight a war with dope money? Well, yes, in the sense that uh, they would not sell dope to earn money to support an operation, but they would look the other way if the people they were supporting were financing themselves by uh, selling dope. General Bang Pao was financed by U.S. government funds. How much was he getting? I don't know what General Bang Pao was getting, but the Mao program, I'm sure, ran several hundred million dollars at the end to fight a war like we were fighting and to have an airline. I don't know what the funding was, but I'm sure the congressional committees have access to those records. As a former chief counsel for the House Select Committee on Narcotics, Joe Nellis did indeed have access to the records. Vang Pao had a heavy hand in the production of heroin in that area. How much of the money that was going to pay these thousands and thousands of tribesmen to fight for us, for the CIA, where was that money coming from? From the trade. From the opium trade? Yes, surely. How would that work? Well, uh, money would be paid for the transportation and the safe arrival of the merchandise to its proper destination. And that money would be paid to the carrier, the person transporting the merchandise. And then that money would be used to pay off the farmers. But as I told you, they got so little of it that there was an enormous amount left over. And it was that money that was used to, to uh, feed to the uh, peasants in order to get them to continue not only fighting for us, but also uh, continuing to give us very important intelligence about the movement of the North Vietnamese. We wouldn't have permitted it. Been, it would have been too dangerous. Why? You know, because the American uh, system wouldn't put up with it. I have never revealed any classified information that I, uh, that I obtained when I was with the committee, and I, I'm not going to start now, but I do know that uh, that was verified. That it was known here? Yes. Well, without getting into classified information, was that at a high level or a low level? Well, I can't, I can't discuss uh, the level. Um, let's put it this way. You're familiar with the Iran-Contra business? Yes. Uh, that was known at a very high level. It was known at all sorts of levels, really. It's amazing that they could keep it secret as long as they did. And I guess that was the situation with uh, Air America, that uh, the people in CIA certainly knew it. And at that time, uh, Dick Helms, I think, was the head of the office, and I'm sure he must have reported it to uh, Nixon. Former CIA Director Richard Helms told us, quote, I knew nothing of this. 
it certainly was not policy. Uh, it's, it's patently impossible. There are thousands of people involved in the intelligence community of the United States who read the reports, who are intimately familiar with details of field activities. And no such operation could ever be kept secret from the authorities in Washington. It would never be tolerated. Never. Not for a minute. How many people knew what was going well, on? Well, I don't think it was very many at all. Five? A ten? handful. A handful. Maybe a uh, hundred. I personally did not complain. Not at the time. I certainly complained after the fact, but that came as a result of my own awakening as to the rather horrible implications of what we were doing. I left uh, working for the government rather abortively because I just could not tolerate myself what was going on. His disgust was not only at the drug trade, but at the human cost of a war in which the recruits were as young as eight years old. These people were absolutely decimated. The war itself took its own toll. Thousands and thousands of these people were either maimed or killed or died of disease or malnutrition secondary to the effects of the war. Many were bombed. Many were blown away by conflict and combat. What was left after the war was the exodus to the south or to the west. These people have had their whole life destroyed for helping out in our war for helping out in our war. By 1981, six years after leaving Laos, the CIA was fighting another secret war, this time in Central America. The secret army were the Contras, fighting to overthrow the leftist government of Nicaragua. Once again, they were trained and equipped by the CIA. It was time for the old hands to go to work again. It's an irregular war in Central America, and there aren't uh, a lot of people who have experienced uh, an irregular warfare, paramilitary warfare, so it would be natural uh, to see people who are experienced in this kind of uh, operation utilized again. It's the old boy network, as somebody called it one time. You know, I mean, you're, you're, the call goes out, and who's got the experience? It's the same war, different place, and, and, and different names. We're not speaking Laotian, we're speaking Spanish now. But it's the same darn war. I don't care what anybody says. Eugene Hasenfuss was just one of a number of veterans from Laos who answered the call in Central America. When his plane was shot down over Nicaragua in October 1986, an Air America handbook turned up in the wreckage. Hasenfuss had operated out of the Ilopango Air Base in El Salvador, headquarters for the White House Contra Resupply Network. His commander there had been a veteran of another old CIA network. Felix Rodriguez, a Cuban-American, had been sent down from Miami. The feeling that I see now in the Nicaraguan freedom fighters, uh, I, hope, I know they, their experience, because I was left inside once, and I wanted to help them as much as I could. Like Rodriguez, the Miami Cubans of Brigade 2506 are still ready to support the anti-communist cause, 30 years after their failed invasion of Cuba. They were willing recruits for the CIA's war against Nicaragua. The brigade supplied soldiers in the field, commanders, and fundraisers for the Contra cause. The brigade had been created and trained by the CIA for the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. After their defeat, the CIA continued to maintain and use this skilled force of covert operators wherever they were needed. Their numbers grew into the thousands. They had their own navy, as well as other assets provided by the CIA, including businesses and banks. I was in charge. Manuel Artime was the agency's favorite Cuban, handpicked to command both the Bay of Pigs and the covert operations that followed. In 1972, he recruited and arranged CIA training for a brilliant young accountant called Ramon Milian Rodriguez. He ran covert operations out of Miami for the CIA. So Artime had a whole group of people who were his people. Oh, yes. Ar Artime ran a, a very large operation. It was uh, very large. It was very active. 
all over uh, Central and South America. A lot of Cubans go to work with the Central Italian Agency in foreign operations. He was in charge of, uh, other among other things, the Watergate burglars and things like that. Did you launder any money for the Watergate guys? Uh, I made payments for the uh, Watergate burglars, yes. I started out uh, in life uh, in one scandal and I have ended it in another, it seems. After Watergate, the group that Manolo Artime was running in Miami was disbanded. The fact that uh, the burglars were Cuban really hurt in Miami. So uh, we had a situation where uh, people were laid off. Uh, they were just given the assets. Uh, for instance, if you were running a print shop, you kept the print shop. Uh, if, you were, if you had a boat, uh, as there were many boats uh, for surveillance and charges, uh, you just kept the boats. And then that was really the starting off point where you got some well-trained people into the uh, drug business. Many, many Cubans worked for uh, Artimi in that time. Uh, some of them have become uh, very successful, good American citizens. Others have become gangsters. <laughs> But with the secret Contra war to fight, the agency was more interested in covert skills than good citizenship, particularly when it came to raising money. Ramon Milian Rodriguez was ideally placed. With access to the limitless resources of the Medellin cocaine cartel, he had no problem raising cash. You've been a supporter living in the Cuban community, passionately anti-communist and anti-Castro. Uh, you've also been a supporter of the Contras, is that accurate? Yes, sir. Um, are you aware of whether or not narcotics proceeds at some time may or may not have supported Contra efforts? Yes, sir. Narcotics proceeds were used to shore up the uh, Contra effort. Did you personally play a role in some of the transfer of that money? Yes, I did. In 1984, when Congress cut off Contra funding, the White House turned to other sources for support. According to documents, Ramon Milian Rodriguez had been laundering foreign payments for the CIA up through 1982, at the same time as he was laundering cash for the cocaine cartel. He says the CIA turned to him again. To have people like me in place that can be used is marvelous for them. The agency, and quite rightly so, has things that they have to do which they can't never admit to an oversight committee. Right? And the only way they can fund these things is through drug money or through illicit money that they can get their hands on in some way. Was any of the money traceable to drugs or to drug-related transactions? The money that we, uh, you're talking about the money that we provided? That's right. No, sir. And why was that? Because we're experts at what we do. Who's Ramon Millian Rodriguez? He worked for the cartel. So he was laundering money for the cartel? Yes. And he worked with Noriega? Yes. Until last year, Jose Blandon was General Manuel Noriega's head of political intelligence in Panama. He was a key U.S. government witness for the grand jury that indicted Noriega for drug trafficking. General Noriega was more than ready to support the Reagan administration in the Contra War after Congress cut off funding. How important was Noriega to the White House in the Contra resupply effort? He played a key role in the supply of harm to the country. So when various administration officials like Oliver North met with General Noriega, did they know that he was involved with narcotics trafficking? I think that the United States uh, had information that Noriega is involved in drugs since uh, at least eight years. Eight years? So, yes, eight day, so they, know, they, they knew about that. Were they just looking the other way on his drug trafficking? The problem is that uh, for the White House, I mean, for the administration, or the Reagan administration, uh, Nicaragua was so important, and the focus of the, all the foreign policy of the United States in Central America was in Nicaragua in the fight against the communists. 
So for them, drugs was something in second place. Drugs took second place. Yes. Noriega's Contra support earned him powerful friends in Washington, including the CIA director, William Casey. Noriega was on his payroll at a reported $200,000 a year. That was a very special relationship. What kind of special relationship? Well, Noriega talked with Casey, and I have a, at least that I know more than three meetings. And always he's received the support of Casey. What kind of support from Casey? All kind of support, political support. So when somebody tried to investigate anything, the case stopped. Look, this is a very important piece in all this war. So Casey would actually stop investigations of Noriega? Yeah, so the, the men that helped Noriega very much. According to Blandone, Noriega was not the only drug trafficker to reap the rewards of Contra support. The cocaine cartel also saw the advantages of backing U.S. policy. That's the reason why the cartel of Medellin uh, decided in 1983 to cooperate with the Contra. So you're saying in 1983, the cartel started supporting the Contras? Yes. Yeah. And the reason was because they knew that they could therefore get protection? Yes. Yeah. How did they help them out? Was it arms plus cash, or was it just arms? How did that work? They work in different ways. Uh, first, they establish the network to supply arms, and also they pay in cash. If uh, one wants to organize an armed resistance or an armed undertaking for any purposes, the easy place to get the money and the easy places to get the guns are in the drug world. General Paul Gorman so was the commander of the U.S. Southern Command based in Panama in from 1982 to 1985. The most ready source of money, big money, easy money, fast money, sure money, cash money, is the narcotics racket. General Gorman was asked whether the Contras could have relied on drug cash. Based on your knowledge of how it works and what you understood from your experience down there, it wouldn't surprise you? Not at all, particularly if uh, they'd been on somebody's payroll and had uh, their funds cut off. That would be the natural recourse for those people. How much money was actually contributed by you or through you for the Contras, total? It was a little under $10 million. I presume it wasn't all sent in one suitcase? Oh, no, no. It was, it was delivered on a, a per-need basis. You know, they'd say, we need so, so much at such a location, and we take care of the logistics of it. Millian Rodriguez says he used a series of Cuban-controlled front companies in Miami and Costa Rica to funnel the $10 million to the Contra cause. These fronts range from banks to obscure fish companies, located in out-of-the-way Miami shopping centers or in provincial port towns in Costa Rica. The route for the drug cash was carefully disguised. Are you familiar with the name of a company called Frigoríficos de Punteranas? Yes, sir, I am. What is that company? Well, it's a shrimp uh, processing warehouse, but uh, more importantly, it was... Um, one of the fronts that we used. Did you set it up? What role did you play in it? I was a key person in setting up uh, the interlocking chain of companies around Frigorifico de Punta Arena. There were payments or arrangements made by which the Contras could receive money through Frigoríficos? Yes, sir. If you add up what it costs to run the Contra operation, and you get to a bottom line figure, and you deduct from that the known sources, you're going to have a tremendous deficit. And I think the question's got to be where the deficit, you know, how was the deficit taken care of? There was a deficit. Yes. They realized that. And we took care of it. I've been spending some time uh, looking at the numbers here of the amount of aid that the Contras were getting at various times. And I come to the conclusion that we're missing something that there's got to be another source of funding for the Contras other than those which this committee has so far identified. We were Last summer, the Iran-Contra committees were aware that there had been an unacknowledged source of money from somewhere. I think there's got to be some other source of funds that we, meaning we, meaning this uh, committee has not yet uncovered. 
Well, I, uh, I don't think I can help you there. I, I don't know of anything else. The war costs so much every day. Mm -hmm. They were getting a certain amount, thanks to you, through Switzerland. And many others, yes. And many others. But the war costs more than that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how much more it cost? Well, I think uh, uh, Director Casey asked me a, a similar question in the spring of uh, 86, I think it was. And I told him that uh, I thought that the, that the Contra effort would need a minimum of uh, $10 million over the next three months, over and above the monies that we could uh, apply, in order to uh, hang in there through the summer months until the Congress uh, would act. Uh, there was uh, some expectation in the White House, I guess, and in state that the Congress would act much sooner than they acted. Uh, things were going downhill rapidly. Did the people who received this money, were they aware of the fact that this was drug money, the proceeds came from drug money? I, uh, let's put it like this, uh, Senator DiMauro, the uh, Contra peasant in the field did not. But the men who made the contact with me did. At that time, I was under indictment. I mean, I was uh, uh, red hot. His arrest was well publicized. The $5 million seized with him brought Vice President Bush to Miami to pose with what the money launderer termed his petty cash. Did Ramon Million Rodriguez have any friends who were working in the uh, Contra Resupply Network? Yes. Who would that have been? Felix Rodriguez. Felix Rodriguez. Yes. A veteran of the Artime organization and the CIA, Felix Rodriguez was a key member of the White House Resupply Network. The Senate was told by the money launderer that it was Felix Rodriguez who solicited the drug cash. If you have a fellow that's a tremendous patriot like Felix Rodriguez, who has sacrificed his personal needs uh, for the cause of fighting communism, and all of a sudden he finds himself in a position where his troops are going to run out of money. They won't have uh, money for bullets, for food, for medicine. Uh, I think uh, in the case of Felix, it might have been something done out of desperation. They had to get money and, and they were willing to get it from any source to continue their war. When they go on the offense, they burn up a lot of uh, ammunition, weapons, need a lot of air resupply, radios, uniforms, boots, food, all this stuff. You know, the, the cost just goes up. Well, there are allegations that, um, that Felix Rodriguez was desperately trying to make up that deficit. Uh, if he was, I, it certainly didn't come to our attention. Not so at all. you had no knowledge of it? No, not at all. Well, the allegations are that he tried to make up the deficit by soliciting money from drug traffickers and Well, Florida. I thought you were circling back to that, but uh, certainly we didn't hear anything like that at the time. And as I said, uh, Felix is no friend of mine, but I'd be astonished if he were involved with uh, drug traffickers. I really would. When General Noriega told you that Felix Rodriguez was friendly with Ramon Millian Rodriguez, were you surprised to hear that uh, Felix Rodriguez would be involved with a drug trafficker? Surprise? Why? According to Blandone, while Felix Rodriguez was supplying the Contras from Ilopango, he was receiving arms shipments arranged with the help of this man, Mike Harari, a former Israeli intelligence agent and a key aide to General Noriega. Harari, says Blandone, was also in business with the cocaine cartel, using the same network to ship arms and drugs, all with the sanction of the CIA. Did he get involved with narcotics trafficking in the course of helping to supply the Contras with weapons? Yes, that was part of the business. So he was moving cocaine? Yes. From Colombia to the United States? No. Uh, they used, they moved the, coca the cocaine from Colombia to Panama to the um, Arab Strip in Costa Rica or Honduras to, to the United States at the same time that he was gathering up arms for the Contras? Yes. Where were the arms coming from? From Yugoslavia and from the East Bloc. 
the communist countries. From 1983 to 1985, says Blendone, this network, supported by Israeli and U.S. intelligence, was a major source of arms for the Contras. Harari, the Israeli who was working with Noriega, was working with Felix Rodriguez. Yes. And Harari, at the same time, was involved with drug trafficking. Yes. Who was Felix Rodriguez working for or with when he approached you? Well, the only government uh, mention that he made was Vice President Bush. And what was his relationship with Bush, as you understand it? He was reporting directly to Bush. I was led to believe he was reporting regularly to the Vice President. He was in touch with the VP's office uh, on a number of occasions. I really don't know. I, I've never understood that relationship. The request for the contribution made a lot more sense because Felix was reporting to George Bush. If Felix had come to me and said, I'm reporting to uh, anyone else, let's say, you know, Oliver North, I might have been more ske skeptical. I didn't know who Oliver North was and I, don't, I didn't know his background. But you know, if you have a, and, we, and let's say we'll call him an ex-CIA operative, even though it's not true, uh, you know, uh, he's a, a current operative. Who is? Felix. You know, everyone says he's ex-CIA. Well, he's... Felix Rodriguez. Yeah, there's nothing ex about him. Uh, but if you have a CIA, what you consider to be a CIA man, coming to you, saying, I want to fight this war, we're out of funds, can you help us out? I'm reporting directly to Bush on it. I mean, it's very real, very believable. Here you have a CIA guy reporting to his old boss. This February 1985 memo from General Paul Gorman confirms that Bush and the Cuban had known each other for years and that Rodriguez's primary responsibility was Nicaragua and the Contra FDN forces. Rodriguez, quote, is operating as a private citizen, but his acquaintanceship with the vice president is real enough going back to the latter's days as director of Central Intelligence. Rodriguez's primary commitment to the region is in Nicaragua, where he wants to assist the FDN. Did you say anything to Vice President Bush about your activities on behalf of this resupply operation? No, sir. Not to him or anyone his staff. But when Hasenfuss was shot down, the first call that Rodriguez made from Central America was to a staffer of Vice President Bush. Questions about that call forced the Bush office to put out a summary, listing 17 meetings with Rodriguez, including three with Bush himself. Nevertheless, the vice president has insisted that these contacts with Rodriguez concerned only El Salvador, not the Contras. He wasn't selling drugs. Uh, we were, you know, he was just raising money. Tainted money granted, but uh, for a very good cause. Felix Rodriguez claims he met with the cartel's money launderer only once and never solicited cash. We permitted narcotics. I mean, we were complicitous as a country in narcotics traffic at the same time as we're spending countless dollars in this country to try to get rid of this problem. It's mind-boggling. Is the war on drugs a big priority in this country, really? Oh, no. No, it's largely a joke. There is no war on drugs. No president who's ever announced one has ever fought one. And no president who's ever announced one has ever given the soldiers the ammunition with which to fight one. The intelligence agencies of this country, by God, should be involved in this battle instead of working with the scum of the earth, which they've been doing. They should be involved in this battle as a crusade for the survival of this country and this hemisphere. I don't know if we've got the worst intelligence system in the world. I don't know if we've got the best and they knew it all and just overlooked it. But no matter how you look at it, uh, something's wrong. Something is, is really wrong out there. Now, you can deny uh, U.S. government uh, involvement in drugs all you want but the patterns are there and, and the players are there popping up again and, and you know eventually someone is going to uh, realize that the, what the truth is
This summer, both Ramon Millian Rodriguez and Felix Rodriguez are expected to testify publicly in front of Senator Kerry's committee about the drug cartel's alleged $10 million contribution to the Contras. Vice President Bush declined to be interviewed for this program or to reply to Frontline's written questions about his relationship with Felix Rodriguez. Thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night. Next week, the future of the U.S. commitment to the NATO alliance. We're the cutting edge. The front line, the first people uh, that will be engaged in any type of conflict. But when nuclear weapons are reduced in Europe, could the armies of NATO actually win a war? We feel that our skills outnumber their numbers. Watch the defense of Europe.